So basically, actually, what we are going to do, okay, 15 minutes. We realized we had a very small period of time, and we wanted to kind of be able to tell you the next bit of the story of the Roxy. So what you get is the beginning in Beverly's book, and we're going to use this story to kind of start to highlight some of the things that we're realizing about a social brand. And actually, Direct TV nailed a lot of those points really beautifully about brands being a social experience. So go ahead, Nick. Oh. Well, we're going to run you just like uh, cliff notes of, of kind of what we've been through for the last couple of years. Can, can you all hear me? Sorry. Yes. yes. You want to turn, turn it down? No, you're good. Okay. Uh, oh, good. It really, really works. Um, so just want to tell you where we were on the Sunset Strip. Um, real quick, you know, we have this legendary status on the Strip of all the metal bands and the Doors and Buffalo Springfield and just so much history on the Strip that we got very complacent and we thought a lot of ourselves and we, you know, we, we basically had this red velvet rope mentality of we're so great, um, you know, no sharing, all the clubs were very individual, um, not really trying to help even the bands um, and definitely not the fan, like that was really the last person that we were thinking about. Um, and th these are some of the things that we, we had about maybe six years ago we were going through. We were really these castles on the strip and building walls and, and not talking to our neighbors. And you know, then the recession hit and we literally looked in our neighborhood and said, you know, who can help us? And we didn't even know our neighbors. We didn't know the managers of the other clubs. We didn't know what bands really mattered. Just really had our head in the sand. Um, and so, you know, these are some of the points, competition, uh, not community, uh, it was all about us. And if we could get that band, and if we could pay them more than the other club, that was what we were gonna do. It was very, very competitive. And then, at the same time, while we're fighting with ourselves, other communities around LA were starting to open up, such as Silver Lake. Uh, it, was, it wasn't that much to live there, or it was, it was less expensive, so you had bloggers, artists, bands. They kind of all bonded together and started this an online community, an offline community, something that we just didn't have on the Strip. Um, and then, one of the main things that happened to the Strip is that we lost Tower Records. And so, this was a pillar, this was one of the corners of our community. And the thought went through my head, if Tower Records could go, that's been there for 35 years, what's not to say the Roxy, the Whiskey, the Viper, the Key Club, that we are all just going to domino and, and, and be gone. Um, and that's basically where uh, Kira, you know, knocked on the door through a friend and, and, and sat down with us and, and had a very honest conversation. I'll let you jump in there. So, the first thing... Uh-oh. Yep. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing that we did is we took a look and we said, who are we? So I sat down with this, the crew at the Roxy, and we, what Nick now calls whiteboarding your soul, and we took an honest, hard look, who is the Roxy? What are people saying about us? What do we think about ourselves? How does our staff treat people? What does the press say about us? So we took a look at this as a group, and then we decided we need to take a look at what's really going on versus our perception on our, in the ivory tower up here on the hill. And we realized that being authentic was the most important thing that we could do, is to start to really find ourselves, find our voice, and be who we are, instead of trying to be the East Side, or be who we were in the 90s. We are who we are today, so we need to own that. The next thing, which was incredibly important, was being transparent. And this was a real challenge in the beginning, because there were not a lot of fans of the Roxy in Los Angeles at the time. And when being transparent, we actually had to step out on the stage and take it. And we had to listen and we had to be honest. Yes, you know what? We haven't been getting it right. Yes, the drinks may be a little overpriced. Yes, we have some issues with security. But we, we were honest about it and we let people know. The next step was you have to listen. So first we had to find out who are we, and then we had to listen. And that is where things got <laughs> very difficult. Because we put up a blog and we welcomed comments, and we got many of them. And I'd say we went through this process for about six months, really hardcore, responding to every negative comment out there, and really taking that information and looking inside. And, and a lot of the comments, 
had nothing to do with the post. So I was trying to post and tell them to come to the show tonight, and they were telling me that my bouncer was a jerk. So it was, they'll find you wherever you are, yes. and they'll let you know. Um, and then, you know, from this basically this kind of engagement, something that the Roxy had never done for a long time, or maybe ever, was uh, we had to listen. And then not only did we listen, we had to then, if our drink prices were too much, we had to respond with, we're dropping our drink prices by 30%. Um, you know, and, and maybe put the bottom line aside for a moment, because at this point we were trying to resurrect the brand, clean up the brand, um, all those different things. And at that point, it, it wasn't a brand, it was a nightclub. So it was more day-to-day -day stuff that we were trying to clean up. Um, a quick story that I think some of you have heard before is um, the real-time um, customer service was so important to us. And when uh, about three or four years ago, when, when Twitter was very new, we had the, a little alert. And if someone mentioned the Roxy, I'd get an email. And uh, one time I read this email and it says, uh, just got an overpriced gin and tonic at the Roxy, uh, very typical of whatever. Just something that I read it and like, it took to heart. It really, like, that's not my business. So I looked at her little icon and I run around the club and there's 500 people there and I see this girl in the lobby with an empty drink and her head in a Blackberry. So I, so I was stalking her. So I go to the bar and I'm like, triple gin and tonic, you know, and then I go up to her, tap her on the shoulder, I'm like, uh, did you just tweet? You know, she looks at me and she, we had a weird moment there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I gave her the drink and, you know, said this is from the Roxy and she turned around and, and uh, you know, tweeted out, you know, hey, the Roxy's all right. So I think those, those little baby steps were very important to listen and then, and then respond. And then, you know, from, they'll tell you again what they want. And you kind of, if it's, if it's drink prices, if it's parking, if it's better bands, if you're listening and you're looking out at what people are saying, you're going to see those things pop up and, and you're going to have to do something about it. And then another area for us that, that, that was really important was breaking down those walls and, um, and starting to talk to our neighbors. And something that just didn't happen on the strip, you had a bunch of old club owners that were, were at war. And then you had this new generation come in that really wanted to share and wanted to go have drinks with each other and we were all the same age. And, and it, it just, it really created a new opportunity. And we went from this, this you know, competition to co opetition and how do we work together? And, 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 and believe it or not, it, it, it started to happen. The Viper Room called, let's go have lunch. Hey, why don't we do a show together? So just slowly it started to come around. And then we said, wow, we have this amazing online community. How do we take that online community and, and get them in the clubs? Because at the end of the day, we need to make money. And it's great that we have this great conversation and that we're changing our business. But how do we get them in? And we were able to do things like tweet crawls, uh, which was go from one business to the next. And as they would go through that business, everybody would follow them. They would tweet them out. So each business picked up 30, 40 new followers. And the voice that came out, it looked so big. Again, perception was that, whoa, this is a huge event happening. And it was really 40 or 50 people. But you know, multiple times tweeting, it looks really bigger than it is. And you know, this, this, this kind of created this environment where it wasn't about them or us. It, it was really about the Sunset Strip as a whole. And the beginning of what we call the social strip, which is this sharing and, and helping each other, really came out of these couple tweets that, that we screen capped. And uh, basically what happened was the Viper Room came online and they had about 100 people and the Roxy was about 10,000 people. And the uh, conversation in the office was, hey, do we kind of promote our competitor? Our closest competitor was the Viper Room. Um, do we support them? And the, we came up with, yeah, let's go ahead and say, hey, all of our 10,000 people, let's follow the Viper Room. A week later, the Viper Room did the same for us. Two weeks later, the Comedy Store came on. And then, as you can see, now we've started something that is still continues today, this very, um, you know, uh, this environment that we created called the Social Strip, where it's all about helping each other and supporting each other. Okay, so, Building a 
community with our neighbors was incredibly important because we had to start where we actually lived. But at the same time, we were also building community with our fans. And the first thing that we had to do was go where they are. So rather than trying to build another wall garden and bring everybody to us, we went where they were. Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, <coughs> Tumblr, our newsletter. And do you know, if you are, have an email list, use it. It's another great way to really engage with your fans. Um, and Instagram, which some of you may or may not know about, it's a photo sharing site through the iPhone app now, and so we've realized there's another opportunity there for the Roxy to connect with people. Yeah, where, literally wherever they are, whatever they're doing, see if that technology works for you. If it doesn't, don't force it. But for us, taking pictures is something natural. We have bands coming in every day. We have artists on stage. Um, we have great stuff to take pictures. We wanted to share that, um, so we, we felt like this was the right place for it. Go ahead. Uh, Groupon, we were the first venue to use Groupon. Um, and uh, we, obviously you can see it's a very aggressive discount up there. And the, the point of us using Groupon was not so much to bring in business to the club, but was to drive traffic to the website and again show that the Roxy is leading the way on the social side. So we needed to start a conversation, which is incredibly important to do because if any of you manage communities, you know that it is really hard to get people engaged. So rather than just talking about music all the time, even though this is the best rock band in the 90s question. But also, and it wasn't about selling all the time. This is something that Roxy has learned. It's not always about the show of the night, the show of the night, the show of the night. Here's our merchandise. We want you to buy this. We want. It was more. How do we create, we have a community, how do we talk to the community um, in an honest way and it not, not using them to sell them on something? Um, this is another great thing that we've started to do. Um, submit your best haircut ever. Submit your best tattoo. Submit your cutest pet. You'd be amazed at the amount of engagement. We had 93 <laughs> likes and 15 comments within a very short period of time of posting that. So it's really about finding out what is going on with that audience and talking to them about things that are important to them. I mean, obviously, maybe the direct TV customers are not going to be as interested in talking about your favorite haircut, <laughs> but there are things that your customers and your fans are interested in that really don't have to do with your product that will really help to boost that engagement. Um, and expanding the audience was actually the third leg of what we had to do to really blow out the size of our fan base. And Nick was right on top of the Facebook ads and really figured out how to use them. So I'm going to let you tell about that. Um, yeah, so Facebook, you know, Facebook ads are amazing. If you're not using them, every single person in this room should call me and I'll teach you how. Um, but um, they, they, you don't waste money. You get down to exactly the person that you want to sell. This one's a little more broad. This one is about bringing people into our page. but. We do, we do $75 worth of ads for each show. So if it's a rock show, we're going to find the 21 to 25 year old that likes rock, that likes metal, that lives in LA, that blah, 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 blah. And we'll find you if you like rock. And we're going to end up on your Facebook page. And it's a very uh, good way to, to, to literally not waste your money and not just put it in the LA Weekly, which we advertise for for um, over 30 years. And um, we probably spent three or four million dollars with them over that time and now we have put all of our money into Facebook advertising. Um, so and you can see on this ad it's very simple. It's metal actually